Good morning, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the inaugural Huntington Woods Art and Garden Fair. Um, we're excited to be have, have, do, be doing this this year. We have three speakers today. Uh, our first one is Maud Lyons, and Maud is um, she, she's had a long career in, in leading arts and garden uh, nonprofits, and she retired in 2020 and bought a home in St. Clair Shores, and then decided she was going to do another garden in this home just because she's been doing gardening her entire life. And so um, she decided this time she was going to do a garden using native plants in Michigan. So she started doing research on that and found a lot of interesting information and realized how important this was. So she's here today to tell us what she found in her research as well as why is it, it is important to uh, plant with native plants in Michigan. So here is Maud Lyons doing Restoring Balance and Beauty with uh, Native Plants. Great. And this will obviously be an informal session, so <laughs> ask me questions if you want. The, uh, so let's start out with understanding that we as human beings have totally overwhelmed the planet. Um, as of last fall, there are over, oh yeah, if you could turn out the lights, that'd be great. If you could, uh, uh, there's over 8 billion people in the world, and we've proved ourselves to be a highly adaptable species. There's literally no place on Earth we haven't figured out how to live. And in the course of doing that, we have transformed between a third and a half of the Earth's land surface, doing all these things you see here, turning prairies into agriculture, logging forests, often more than once, literally moving mountains to get at the precious metals, changing aquifers and, re and, and river flows, um, uh, plastics and other landfills, uh, and also just covering a lot of the Earth with pavement. Um, and as a result, we have literally transformed the, the face of the earth. And it's not just in industry and in uh, uh, agriculture that this has happened. Um, the whole eastern United States used to be one massive forest. Uh, and, uh, and today, uh, a lot of, uh, certainly around here, um, is, is all suburbia that looks like this with houses, with grass around them, and not much else by way of vegetation. We've also, as a human species, uh, disrupted the ecology of every single continent. Some of that's been on purpose, like introducing mammals to New Zealand. People thought that would be a good idea. Um, uh, and some of them have been inadvertent, like bringing the Asian chestnut blight to North America, which wiped out the dominant tree in our eastern forests. Um, but, you know, uh, Phragmites, which you are probably familiar with, common reed grass, um, uh, all kinds of invasive species. In fact, I heard a news report recently about hippos in Colombia, that someone had a private, like, nature farm and brought in a couple of hippos, and there's now like 140 feral hippos uh, in, uh, in Colombia. What, what are the frag mites again? I didn't catch that. I'm sorry. The frag mites? Oh, frag mites. You know that tall grass that you see in marshy areas? It's often on roadsides. Oh. Um, uh, it looks sort of plumy at the top. Sure, yeah. That's called Phragmites. That's the Italian, uh, the, the Latin name. Um, and uh, uh, it's also, I, I think it's also called common reed grass. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's uh, particularly invasive in wetlands, gets into a lot of parks and stuff like that. Uh, the, and so our, our landscape is also filled with uh, plants that have been brought from Europe, Asia, and, uh, uh, and, and Africa and other places. So this is a list of, uh, I was actually surprised when I started doing this research about how many of our beloved and traditional garden plants actually are introduced. Things like forsythia, of course, all of our spring bulbs um, are, are introduced, our ground covers like ivy and myrtle and pachysandra, um, uh, you know, burning bush, barberry, privet, all three of those become invasive in natural areas. Um, a lot of trees um, are uh, not native. And at the end of the list, you see Kentucky bluegrass, which despite its name actually comes from Europe um, and is not a native plant. So what, what are native plants and why do we need them? They're generally defined as plants that were here in this ecosystem before Europeans started moving in with other stuff. So here, that's roughly before 1800. Um, and every ecosystem, prairies, savannas, wetlands, woodlands, and so forth. Um, but why does it matter? You know, if forsythia bush or a rose bush grows perfectly fine in my yard, why, why, why should I care? Um, the, uh, and so there's two main reasons. One is biodiversity, 
and the second is water quality. So in this presentation, I have a number of ahas that as I've done research have really transformed the way I look at gardening. Um, and aha number one, and sort of the foundation of all of them, is that it turns out that most insects can't eat non-native plants, even if those plants have been in our ecosystem for hundreds of years. They simply don't evolve that quickly. So of course, the great example is the monarch butterfly and milkweed. Um, uh, the, the, and it turns out that 90% of insects eat are specialists and only eat one particular uh, type of plant. Uh, the, the, and the way that works is that a plant doesn't want everything to eat it because then it wouldn't survive. Um, and so it puts toxins in its tissues and literally over millennia, certain insects find ways to, to do the work around like the monarch and the milkweed. Um, and so they, that, that toxin is, is not bad for them. And in fact, for uh, caterpillars and monarchs, it's a good thing because the, the toxins in their bodies that come from the milkweed are not good for birds, so they learn not to eat them. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, and so, but monarch butterflies have declined by 96%, um, uh, a really staggering amount. And I love this story. How many of you have read any book by Doug, Doug Ptolemy or heard of him? He's a professor at the University of Delaware. He's an entomologist. And, uh, and he's written the books called Nature's, there's a bunch on your, your handout um, uh, by him. In his backyard, he has a native black cherry tree. Uh, yes, and please hand them out if anybody does, had, didn't get one. The, um, uh, he has a native black cherry tree and a tent caterpillar or moth laid her eggs in his black cherry and when they hatched, it was a young tree. So the caterpillars ate just about every leaf off of the tree. Wrapped around that tree was, was a non-native Japanese honeysuckle. And even though they were starving, they didn't touch one leaf of the honeysuckle. So native trees support way more insects than non-native trees. A native oak tree supports about 500 species of caterpillars in North America, whereas a ginkgo tree, which comes from Asia, only hosts about five of our caterpillar species. And here's how it works. The plants convert the sunlight, the energy from sunlight into their leaves. And then the caterpillars and other insects eat those leaves and convert that into energy in the form of their bodies. And then the birds feed the caterpillars and the other insects to their young. And then, of course, other things feed on the birds. And the same thing is true for amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. All of them eat a lot of insects. Uh, so, so we're really talking about the, 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 the web of life starting with insects. And two of Doug Tallamy's uh, students studied a brood of chickadees and found that, uh, I can only imagine counting over two or three <laughs> weeks, but they estimated that it was between six and 9,000 caterpillars per brood of chickadees that the parents had to bring back to the nest. So this obviously is a robin, not a chickadee, uh, but it was a great picture. Uh, the, uh, the, the, but imagine if this, if this bird cannot find um, uh, food within a reasonable flying distance, they're not going to be able to raise their, 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 their chicks um, and they're going to get exhausted in the process. So native plants are the foundation, the very basis of the biotic community. And the biotic community is in big trouble. In our lifetimes, the lifetimes of everybody in this room or way less, 20% um, of our reptiles are gone, a quarter of our birds have vanished, 25% of our mammals are also gone. 45% of insects globally are estimated to be go gone just since 1974. The earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. And here in Michigan, about 23% of our native plants are at risk. That's according to Michigan University Extension. So why aren't we more concerned? We hear a lot about climate change. Why are we not concerned about biodiversity? Um, and one reason for this is the shifting baseline syndrome. This was uh, coined by a marine biologist in 1995. And if you, the, the bottom picture shows marine life in 1800, the sea is abundantly filled with all kinds of species and lots of every one. By 1950, not as many, but still pretty full. By 2019, starting to look a bit sparse. But every, every, each one of us, each generation of, of people measures normal against what they saw when they were children. So, so you don't know what it looked like 
a hundred years ago. So when we hear stories in Michigan of the vast numbers of whitefish and insects and birds and other things in the past here, we, we think they were just exaggerating or saying stuff so they could get people to move to Michigan. Uh, but we really are failing to comprehend the, the magnitude of the loss that's going on. And uh, a graduate student uh, took this idea of the shifting baseline and did a study of photographs of fishermen in Key West. And the smiles of the fishermen in the 1950s and the 2010s are just as broad, but the fish they're catching are considerably smaller today. And another reason that we don't, uh, aren't concerned about biodiversity is that 80% of us live in uh, cities, towns, or suburbs. So the only time we see nature is when we go for a hike or go on vacation. Our kids aren't having the chance, as I did when I was a kid, and maybe some of you did, to be able to you know, go to the neighborhood creek and crawl around and find stuff, or walk through the woods, or sit in a meadow or a prairie. Uh, the, the, you know, that sense of exploring and that sense of connection to nature. Instead, we have nature centers and we have school community gardens and we have, you know, have what we do in our own backyards. And there's another reason why we aren't more concerned, particularly about insects. We don't really value insects. In fact, we see an insect, we reach for the raid. So, but the insect numbers are declining more than anything else. So why should we be concerned about that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Insects are, are major pollinators of plants. 90% um, uh, of plants are, are pollinated by animals, mostly by insects. Uh, the, the, uh, and so if we want fruit or vegetables or just you know trees, uh, we need insects. Um, they're also, as I said, the basis of the food web for mammals and birds. Um, they're also very important to decompose animal waste to actually return those nutrients to the soil. There's actually a wonderful um, uh, example in Australia where they imported cattle because people bring cattle to places, but the, the native animals have, uh, you know, they, 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 their feces is little pellets because it's such an arid climate. So all of the native dung beetles of Australia didn't know what to do with nice wet cow patties. And as a result, they just sat all over the fields and became a real health hazard. So they literally had to figure out what dung beetle would they import from what other place in order to not be invasive in Australia but take care of this problem. The, uh, uh, and, we, and insects also aerate and enrich the soil because a lot of their life is underground, so they're constantly moving stuff around. And many insects are themselves predators. They prey on other insects and, and uh, keep them in check. So if you spray a lot of pesticide, you're killing the good guys as well as the bad guys. Um, and uh, and the, usually the, 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 the insects you don't want have faster reproductive cycles because nature has accommodated for the fact that they get preyed upon by other insects. So if you kill the predator insects, you actually end up in the long run with a worse, worse problem with the, the, uh, the, 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 the food insects and the pests. So there's a lot of alarm bells going off. In 2017, there was a study in a German nature preserve. Um, how people measure insects is they generally cap trap lots of them and then measure the weight of it. Um, uh, it's, uh, so they found a 75% decline in insect biomass. And in midsummer, when you'd expect there to be peak insects, there was an 82% decline. That same year, a McGill University graduate student found an 80% decline in flies in Greenland. In Puerto Rico, the next year, a researcher went back who'd been there in the late 80s, and he found a reduction of 80% and 98% in his traps. Uh, in 2018, the World Wildlife Fund and the London Zoological Society uh, estimated that just from 1970 to 2014, the total population of the world's wild vertebrates dropped by 60%. So that's am fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds. Uh, so 1992 to 2020, and of course this continues, has been the greatest loss of global biodiversity in the past 65 million years. So think about this a second. 65 million years ago was when the asteroid hit what is now Mexico and wiped out the dinosaurs and a lot else. We are headed towards a multiple mass extinction on Earth. And there's a lot of reasons why insects are declining. Um, and other things as well. Um, habitat, 
farmer farming practices. We now have mega farms. We don't have as many field margins with native wildflowers. We use a lot of insecticides and fungicides. There's a loss of wild areas and native plants. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, native habitats that do exist are badly degraded and patchily distributed. So if it's hard for a butterfly or a bee to shift its range north as the climate changes, imagine how hard it is for a snail or an oak tree to find a better home. And uh, so why are insects declining? Climate change, of course, is a, another reason. And I, I love this example. In Kansas, um, uh, another study looked at uh, the difference in grass uh, over a 30-year period, and with more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the grass actually grows better. It, 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 it overall doubled its grass weight, but the, nit the nitrogen content of that grass dropped to 42 percent, the phosphorus by, by more than half, and almost all the sodium disappeared. So for insects, it's like eating iceberg lettuce instead of kale. And then disruptive timing shifts are another problem. Um, bees and other insects generally emerge based on soil temperature, but flowers uh, uh, bloom based on day length. Uh, and, uh, and so if you have a mismatch of those things, you don't have the right flowers when, you need, when the caterpillars need them, or you don't have the caterpillars when the birds need them. And extreme weather events by themselves don't, don't, don't decimate wildlife, but if you've got a wildlife population, there's always fluctuations, but if it's more down than up, and it's been doing that for some time, and you're starting to get down to a very small population, and you have a wildfire or a hurricane, it can literally take that population beyond the point of return. So uh, about pesticides and fungicides, um, I was amazed to find that pesticide use has doubled in the last 25 years. Um, and those pesticides that we ban in the United States or in the UK get sent to third world countries. Um, most pesticides are also only tested on one insect, like a bee, and not always every species of bee or through its whole life cycle. So you can assume that any pesticide that you pick up that says safe for pets, and you know, don't, don't necessarily believe that. Another danger of pesticides is even if they don't kill the, the insect, they can still disable them. Bees have highly sensitive navigation systems, and it can disable their ability to find their hive. Or if they can find their hive, they can't remember which plants have the best pollen loads, so it's less efficient. And another effect is that the pesticide won't kill them, but it will kill their gut bacteria, which makes them more vulnerable to viruses. That's one of the theories behind the bee crash pop of, uh, of pop bee populations. And by the way, pesticides also appear in us. In Brazil, uh, Roundup has been found in uh, women's breast milk. Um, farm workers that work with this stuff have ne reduced neurobehavioral functioning. And of course, a lot of pesticides have carcinogens in them. And one of the innovations in recent decades is neonicotinoids. And the idea there was instead of spraying crops, what you do is coat the seeds, and then the, the, the plants will absorb that pesticide in its tissue. The problem is it turns out not to be very efficient. 1% of it just ends up as dust in the atmosphere. 94% of it, it's very water soluble, so it leaches into the soil and into our aquifers. So it gets into everything around it that you're not necessarily trying to treat. Um, and only 5% of the neonicotinoid actually helps the, the, the crop. Um, and then also plants that have been affected by neonicotinoids, whether they are the plant, the crop you intended or the wildflowers somewhere else, because if it's in the underground aquifer, it can travel quite a distance. Um, uh, that's been linked to the loss of certain uh, butterfly and moth species here in Michigan um, that have had pretty catastrophic losses. And so another harm, fertilizers also cause a lot of harm. They reduce floral diversity because they favor some plants rather than others. They make uh, plants less palatable or even toxic to the insects that feed on them. They're major pollutants of aquatic systems. Just ask the people in, in uh, Toledo uh, about the problems they have with Lake Erie. Um, uh, also, making pesticides contrib contributes to climate change. The nitrous oxide uh, is uh, in, pest in fertilizers is 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, and it also destroys the ozone layer. And then, uh, and then finally, actually manufacturing fertilizer takes a lot of energy, and usually that comes from fossil fuels. So 
with all of this damage, half of the nitrates applied to, to fields never actually reach the crop. But the news is not all bad for insects. There's some that are going to adapt, like mosquitoes and cockroaches and fleas and aphids. And with less winter kill, there's going to be more year-round breeding. So we're going to see diseases that we thought of, we were all safe here in Michigan, are going to start moving their way north. So going back to why we need insects, we need them as pollinators for the food web, to decompose things, to aerate the soil and enrich it, and to keep other insects in check. So there's many reasons for biodiversity uh, decline. Climate change is a big one. I'm sure you've all heard a lot of uh, competition from invasive species and diseases. Pesticides and fertilizers that I just talked about. Loss of habitat is a really big one. And we need to care about and for other living things. And all of us as individual citizens, it's hard for us to do much other than political action to affect climate change. Um, but we can do a lot on invasive species and pesticides and fertilizers and loss of habitat. So here's a Han number two. Um, native plants, it turns out, are also essential for good water quality. Here in Michigan, we used to have a lot of wetlands with our Great Lakes. Um, and uh, I live over in Macomb County. That's one of the ones in the red that has lost, uh, 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 what, 86% uh, of its wetlands. Um, the, including, I'm sure that's what my backyard was, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Wayne County, it's 90%. Um, but the loss of, of wetlands of all kinds is not just a coastal issue, it also affects our inland lakes. 70% of Michigan's inland lakes are affected adversely by development. So water quality issues that we're facing now, we have the algae bloom in Lake Erie, we have stormwater runoff that causes flooding. Uh, we also have water quality issues with E. coli in Lake St. Clair on a regular basis. Uh, the, so, so how do native plants help with this? And it really comes down to two things, rain gardens and roots. And I love this slide because it just gives you a sense of with native plants, their roots are really deep. Not only have they been here for millennia, but literally like a big blue stem can have roots that go down 13 feet. So it is, it is breaking up the soil. It is bringing nutrients up for other plants. It also, of course, is much more drought resistant because it, has, it can draw water from far, much farther down. Uh, the, and so you can see over on the far left, Kentucky bluegrass, as we all know, has these little tiny shallow roots, which is why we constantly need to irrigate it if we want to have a nice green lawn. Whereas buffalo grass, that's a native grass, though not so much native to Michigan, um, it has, you can over on the far right, you can see has much more deep, deep roots. And this next slide also shows the roots, but what some of these plants look like. You know, the, the uh, uh, blue flag, uh, rose mallow, um, uh, the, the asters, milkweed, up at the top, blazing star, uh, boneset, um, Ohio spiderwort, and uh, black-eyed Susans. All of those have much deeper roots than, you know, frankly, most of the plants we pick up at garden centers. And uh, how many of you know what a rain garden is or even have a rain garden? The, the, what rain gardens are, are basically um, a way to catch the stormwater and hold it so that it can percolate naturally into the underground aquifer instead of just rushing off and, uh, and enhancing erosion and sending a lot of sediment into our waterways. So you hook it up to uh, like the gutter on your roof or some other water source, or it's just a part of your yard that collects water when, the, when it rains. You, you dig out a depression and then fill it with a soil and compost mix that's going to be like a big sponge. And then you plant in it plants that, that, that thrive on periodic inundations. So if they're in standing water for a couple of days, no big deal. Um, and so when the rain enters, it then is held by the plants and their roots, and then it more gradually goes into the, the uh, aquifer underneath. And this is an example on Wayne State University's campus. Um, the difference between a rain garden and a bioswale is a rain garden holds it and, and drops and percolates the water down. A bioswale basically slows it down and directs it. So the rock part of this uh, rain garden is a bioswale, and then the, the, the part with the vegetation is the rain garden. 
And if you have a waterfront, um, uh, native plants can be extremely useful um, to prevent erosion, um, but they're also really important for wildlife. As people have started to build on all of our inland lakes in Michigan, typically they put riprap or rocks or worse yet, uh, you know, seawalls up. And what that means is if you're a turtle, there is no place to go lay your eggs. And uh, uh, if, if, uh, if you're, you're, you know, other kinds of wetland species, there, there's literally no way to get from the water to the land and none of that habitat that you need. And also, if you have grass right down to the edge, those shallow roots aren't going to retain the, when the waves come, um, uh, they're, they're, it's just going to wash away and erode more and more of your property. So, uh, so creating vegetation and vegetative borders um, on waterways is important. So native plants restore our ecology by supporting the web of life. They sequester carbon, they improve water quality, and they reduce storm runoff. What's not to like? Um, so if we could all convert a portion of our backyards and front yards into native plants, we would be addressing all of these environmental issues, feeling like we're really doing something for the earth, and we'd also get the benefit of enjoying a vibrant green oasis outside our doors. So what should we do differently as gardeners? And this is something that has really fascinated me, is because is, it's not just about, oh, let me plant this plant instead of that plant. Uh, we're really trying to recreate ecosystems with native plants and reconnect ourselves to the, the native world. So this is what we're used to. Nice, neat plantings where the plants are like furniture. You have nice mulch, which half the time is treated with something to keep the weeds from growing. You have nice, neat edges, and the plants are in nice little flowering clumps. Um, the, the, they're purely decorative. Ecological planting is different, it's abundant, and we want the plants to mingle and interact with each other. So there's lots of different plant species. It's not just about planting one or two native plants, that actually biodiversity is dramatically enhanced when there's more diversity of species there, whether that's a forest or your backyard. And we want way less lawn. So it turns out that lawns have less to do with, with, with uh, 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 science and sense and everything to do with psychology and politics. Uh, lawns actually, there's been research on this, what kind of landscapes do we as human beings prefer? prefer? And overwhelmingly the answer is, uh, is savannas. We like big open spaces where we can, the theory is we could in ancient times spot the predators coming, but we also like places of refuge where we can be in. And lawns began as a status symbol really in the late 18th century and very much in the 19th century. And then with the expansion of suburbs and better ever better lawnmowers in the 20th century, they're now a convention and they're what we think of as normal landscaping throughout America. So here's the downside of lawns. Kentucky bluegrass isn't a native plant, so it doesn't feed anything uh, the, except the grubs that you don't want. Uh, the, the lawn care treatments are toxic to insect and wildlife. So you see somebody with a perfect lawn, you know you've got a dead zone looking at you. Um, caterpillars in trees also, to overwinter, they need to fall from the tree into the leaf litter and pupate there. Sometimes they bury themselves in the earth, sometimes they just stay in the leaf litter. Um, uh, if there is hard packed surface beneath the tree or just lawn, it's very difficult for insects to, to find that way to overwinter. And the United States is estimated to have more than 50 million acres of lawn. So we as gardeners need to embrace the native plant aesthetic, which is a lush sense of nature and complex plant communities. It's gonna be about the foliage as much as about the flowers. And we want to use the lawn to set off the planting beds instead of the flower beds as a border for the lawn. So I like to think of this as the lawn is an area rug, not wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. We want to move from having manicured parks to glorious woodlands that have all kinds of shrubs and other layers in them. And we need to really be sharing the earth with other living things, and that starts at our homes. So how is gardening with native plants different? Uh, how is it different when you're trying to create a plant community that's a foundation for life? 
So the, the, the fundamental principle is that you're engaging with the landscape instead of merely applying plants to it. So in traditional horticulture, we kind of, you know, we look at how much sun is there and what will grow. We take a, you know, pH sample and, and so forth. And then we try to adjust it for the plants that we want. In natural planting, we start with the site and we see what will naturally work there. And nature abhors a vacuum, so there are always plants that will work in your conditions. And, uh, and you start from that. So instead of having, so the advantage to us as gardeners is you don't have to amend the soil pH or change the texture or water it or drain it or you, you find the native plants that have evolved for those very conditions. So here's aha number three. The key to building plant communities is what's called vertical layering and dense planting. Um, and so this is what it looks like. The structural plants, which are the trees and the tall perennials like Joe Pieweed, have very deep roots. They're the structural layer. They go down a long ways, they go up a long ways, and they kind of uh, are, create the focal points in your garden. The vignette or the seasonal theme layer is all of those blooming plants that people who aren't gardeners, that's the only thing that they see. Um, and they also have fairly deep roots. And then the, the thing that was new to me is this idea of the matrix or the underlayment, which is the plants that grow around the base of the other plants, so they're more shade tolerant because they've got all these bigger plants around them. And they, they have very shallow roots, so stolons and rhizomes. Um, uh, and so they fill in all the spaces and once established, that helps to keep the weeds down because the weeds don't have any bare earth to land on. So the structural layer is what gives your garden form and focal points. It also tends to create boundaries of your garden rooms, like a hedge. Uh, the, the, the seasonal theme or the vignette layer is those you know, wonderful waves of blooms that you have. Uh, and then the matrix layer is that floor or green weft that ties everything together. So as an example, the structural layers, the trees in the background and the tall vertical evergreens, the seasonal vignette layers, like everything colorful in the middle, and the matrix you almost don't notice. It's coral bells and other low-lying plants. So here's aha number four. No bare ground anywhere. What you want is to fill your garden with an abundance of plants. So the, the mulch that you're using is literally like leaf litter that you just leave there. Another advantage is you don't do fall cleanup because you leave that for things to over, insects to overwinter. Uh, uh, so uh, you aren't going to be buying those eight bags of mulch that you used to have to buy every spring. And so you want something that looks like this. Now, the problem, of course, is that not all of us have that kind of space. Um, and so I'll get to that. Um, this is my backyard, and I discovered there's a native plant called horsetail um, that on the left you can see it looks like little miniature trees. On the right, that's what it looks like in June, and it loves wet clay, which is what my yard is, and uh, it's a good thing that I like it because there is no way on earth I could get rid of this. <laughs> um, uh, but it does provide this wonderful green, soft texture underneath and around all the other native plants that you see there. So here's a ha number five. You're gonna choose the plants that love the site you have. So are you wet, are you dry, clay, loam, or sand, sunshade, acidic, or alkaline, whatever it is, there's a plant for you, and lots of them. Um, so the benefits for us as gardeners is that once they're established, they're more drought tolerant because of those deep roots, so less watering, lower water bills, less time spent doing that. They like the soil as it is, so you don't need to think, oh, when do I fertilize them? Uh, they resist native insects and diseases. They feed some, resist others, so they're less prone to, uh, to uh, you don't need to use pesticides. Um, there's less weeding because there's no bare ground for those weed seeds, to, or at least as many of them, to take root. Um, and there's less mowing because you have torn up your lawn and put native plant beds in, in that place. So here's a ha number six that the garden isn't about the, play, the plants, it's actually about the overall place that they create. So what you are really creating is habitat. And, and so you wanna think about essentials like are there grass and sticks and muds for the birds to nest and also insects? Is there continuous food sources through the season? You know, berries, seeds. Uh, you know, we have bird feeders, but actually there's, uh, like robins don't go to bird feeders because they all eat insects and, and, uh, and worms. Um, the, uh, are there, is there access to water 
um, uh, which could be as simple as puddles or a, a bird bath? Um, and do you have protection? Do you have places where insects and birds can find uh, a safe harbor? So you aren't competing with nature, you're really creating a plant-driven place as an engine for living. So the native garden approach is your success is the overall level of plant diversity, not just the individual plants. And, uh, and the goal is the stability of the whole, not just the sum of any one kind. And gardening this way also depends on noticing things. Um, I'm in the third year now with my native plant garden, so it's been a joy this spring to come around and go, oh, you've come up, and, uh, or to say, oh my goodness, you've spread, that's wonderful. Or, you know, and that last summer I found plants in places where I hadn't planted them. Um, so it's great to see what the plants teach me about the microclimates in my yard. And an ecological garden isn't going to restore pristine nature. You can't do that in the space of your backyard, but it can embrace nature and really make a difference. And then after a while, this kind of garden will be remaking itself. So that's part of my plan as a, a senior is that I'm doing all the hard labor now so that you know, in, in 10 years when I'm not able to get on my knees as much and do other stuff, I can just sit there and enjoy the shrubs, which have now grown larger. So. Here's something that's really bedeviled me though, is, is all of this ecological stuff is great, but how do you make it beautiful? And how do you make it something that, that you, your neighbors are comfortable with? Um, there's an awful lot of native plant gardens that just get totally messy looking. So this is our default, you know, trees that look like lollipops, grass. This takes a bit of getting used to. So how is there a happy medium between the two? And what I've learned is that the design approach is really how do you create a sense of purpose and order so that the other people around you are going to be reading that this is intentional. So this is a house in St. Clair Shores um, uh, and they've actually put three rain gardens on their property, one where you see the reddish tree, another one behind that and one in the backyard. Uh, the, so they've rerouted all the water from their gutters to go there. Um, they put in the gravel path so that they'd have access to be able to weed and, and tend to their plants. And they happen to be around the uh, corner from an elementary school, so every day parents uh, come twice a day to drop their kids off and pick them up. And hundreds of kids go walking down this. So they planted very resilient plants in the strip between the sidewalk and the curb and thoughtfully put stepping stones. And I've seen many kids hop from one to the other, which means they're also avoiding the plants, which was of course their, their plan. Um, and by the way, I, I asked them and they said not one of their neighbors had an issue with this. They all thought it was great. Um, so another trick is to create large blocks of color and texture. You know, it's not about one signature plant, it's about, you know, a group of black-eyed Susans or, you know, a stand of Joe Pyweed, like you can see in the back there. Another interesting design tri uh, tip is when they bloom, try not to have more than three different colors bloom at once. It just feels a lot less miscellaneous. So here you have yellow and blue and some pops of white. And another trick is to use the, the matrix, and horticulturists love sedges, particularly Pennsylvania sedge. So here you have alliums growing up through Pennsylvania sedge, and you have uh, 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 um, salvia growing up through Pennsylvania sedge. So that's another approach where you, you don't try to have so many things, um, but you try to have the sedge as the ground cover that greens up early, stays green late in the season, and then you know things that, that come up and give you seasonal interest. Another trick is if you have paths and sidewalks, plant lower paths next to them because the taller plants are going to flop and get in the way. So just give them room to do that and it also helps people feel less closed in. And this is my backyard. Um, I have planted sedges all along uh, the edges of my paved stone paths. And, uh, the, the, uh, uh, and that's worked out really well and they also look terrific when the wind blows on them and, and moves all of the leaves. Another trick is uh, taken from traditional horticulture is there's no reason not to have a hedge but put black-eyed Susans in the middle of it instead of something that's non-native. 
And uh, having island beds with grass around them is another good trick, particularly for front yards. Um, this is often done for rain gardens, but just even for a native planting. Uh, because having the trimmed grass around it just reads to people as, oh, this is tended, this is taken care of, this isn't just weeds. And if all else fails, put up a sign and convince everybody that you're doing it for the birds. So do you really need that lawn? This is my backyard on the left in 2020 when I bought the house. Um, the back fence had daylilies, overgrown wisteria, and loosestrife in there. And this is what it looked like last summer with the, you can see the, the, the sedges and uh, I do have mulch there because I just planted things. So, so uh, but I, w I won't ever have to put mulch down there again. It's already a lot more abundant than that. Um, so there's a service berry tree in the middle of it and uh, oh, there's a whole lot of different native plants. Uh, if you have a, a backyard, you can always round the corners and create an area with more depth so your backyard becomes maybe more oval than rectangular. Uh, and somehow that ended up upside down, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, you can also take out the grass altogether with pavers and then just have native plants around the edges. That's particularly effective for smaller backyards or places where you don't have a lot of space. Just have the people space be open and clear and then you don't have to mow the grass and then you have the plants to look at. So here's aha number seven that if you can only plant a few plants, it turns out that some of them matter more than others. And those are called keystone plants. Um, and another thing to bear in mind is that it's all about biomass. So when you're designing your native plants garden, think about trees first, shrubs second, and perennials third. Very often we just start with the perennials, but the fact is in the long run, uh, planting an oak tree is gonna make a way bigger difference. Um, so, and if you're going to plant a tree, by all means plant a native tree. All trees, you know, provide shade that reduces temperature, that can help with our air conditioning bills. They actually, there have been studies in Cincinnati and Philadelphia that show how neighborhoods are safer with more tree cover and more gardens. Um, the trees also take pollutants out of the air. Uh, and they also, of course, sequester carbon. But native trees, in addition to all of that, support wildlife. So how can you increase the native plants in your garden? The first thing you're gonna do is identify opportunities for new planting beds. Where are those areas of your lawn that, that you just doesn't get used? Are there boggy or wet spots after rain that are just a problem or a place where no matter what you do, the grass isn't gonna grow there? All, it doesn't have to be a large area and you don't have to do it all at once. So a small rain garden in that strip between your path to your front door and the driveway could be a great place for a rain garden or just a bed. If you have a swimming pool, the kids are gonna play in the pool, why not fill the area around it with plants? And then another question to ask is what functions are you going for? Um, what are your site conditions? Are you primarily building a garden for the pollinators and biodiversity? Or do you want stormwater remediation? Are you trying to build insect and bird habitat? Um, uh, and of course, what's your soil texture, moisture, pH, light? And light is really important and so is wind. Um, and what plants then naturally thrive in those <laughs> conditions? So there's lots of different levels. If you wanna start small, you could have a container with black-eyed Susans in it or you know, or, or uh, one of the prairie grass plants. You can add native plants and mix them in next to your existing non-native plants. You could plant a native tree in 30 years. You know, the old saw about a tree, when's the best time to plant a tree 30 years ago? When's the second best time now? So uh, the, you can add native shrubs as well. Those are particularly good for birds. And of course, you can stop using pesticides and fertilizers. So all of those are quick and easy steps. If you wanna move it up and get a bit more ambitious, you can start giving up some of your lawn and putting in native plant beds. You can uh, add your native plant beds in phases over the years. You can increase the plant density, but also the diversity, planting lots of different things. Um, I, I personally, my philosophy as a gardener is that you do all your research and then you plant lots of things and whatever succeeds, you plant more of and what doesn't succeed, you don't tell anybody about. <laughs> and uh, you can build a rain garden and also buy from local native plant growers. 
uh, the, the, and I can talk more about what you get at garden stores that are cultivars, but they aren't as good as the plants we can get. Uh, in the handout, there's several uh, sources locally for native plants. And if you're all in and crazy like me, you're going to create a site plan of your property, which is what I did the first winter. You're going to research lots of different plants because there's an overwhelming amount of information to just absorb. Um, you're going to remove the non-natives and the invasives, in my case, loose strife. You're going to take out lots of turf. You're going to plant very densely and you want larger beds so that you're creating bigger areas for wildlife. You're going to weed and water when you need to establish things, but hopefully not so much after that. And in, it'll take at least three or four years to fully establish and of course more than that for shrubs and trees to fully uh, mature. So this is what my backyard looked like when I bought the house. I had an above green ground swimming pool in the middle, a little patio with a mulch trail around it, and uh, grass, and then a little mulched figure eight under the two cedar trees. And everything else was kind of grass. That's what it looked like last summer. Um, I put in a whole bed that was between the patio and the driveway, because who wants to look at cement? Um, I extended the area out under the cedar trees and made that go all the way to the, uh, the east fence. Um, and then I have a big lot, in a, a big planting bed in the back. So here's Ahan number seven, um, getting to those keystone plants. It turns out that 60% of North American native bees only eat pollens from 40% of our native plants and 14% of native plants support a whopping 90% of the butterfly and moth species. And just 5% of native plants support 75% of that caterpillar food web, uh, food that drives food webs. So uh, if you only have room for a few plants, go for these. So in the tree category, there are the top five in our region are uh, oak, all species of oak. You can see they support 436 species of caterpillars. Um, American plum, um, uh, the birch trees, eastern cottonwood, and maple, all of which support hundreds of species of caterpillars. So oak trees, of course, you know, take a long time to grow, but uh, uh, are magnificent trees. I have a swamp oak in my backyard because I have a swamp. And uh, the, the uh, but there's all different kinds of oaks uh, that, that will, um, uh, that are good for different kinds of sites. Um, the American plum uh, is a, a tree that flowers and fruits. Uh, the Audubon Society has partnered with naturehills.com, so I took this off their website um, uh, that shows some of the birds, and so they're, they're, they're promoting particular kinds of American plum and other shrubs and small trees that are good for birds and wildlife. Paper birch or other kinds is river birch, there's black birch, other kinds. Um, those are taller trees. Um, they're very attractive. You can get them with multi trunks. They like full sun, but they also like moisture and cool roots. So I planted mine on the north side of my garage. And this is one none of us will plant in our backyard, a cottonwood, uh, because they're huge, they're tall, and they also have these cottony things that, you all, that get all over everywhere and your neighbors will totally hate you. The, uh, uh, but red maples are a great street tree and very common. Um, uh, maples are, are, are drought tolerant. They're also tolerant of salts, which is why they're a great tree, st street tree. There's also like a red maple that likes uh, wetter soil more. Uh, there's maples that like drier soil. They, of course, have gorgeous fall color. And in perennials, the top five list are goldenrod, aster, sunflowers, black-eyed Susan, and tick seed. And you can see that all of these not only support a lot of caterpillars, though less than the trees, they also uh, have pollen, uh, the slide adjusted, sorry, but the second row of numbers is the amount of bee species that use their pollen, because the bees feed the pollen to their young. They, the nectar is for the adult bee, but the pollen is for the, 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 uh, the, the next generation of bees. Um, so you want to look at both of those things. So goldenrod, if you don't already know, is not what makes us sneeze in August. That is, is ragweed, which is wind pollinated. Um, uh, so its spores literally are designed to get into your nose and, uh, um, and spread. But goldenrod is, is, is insect pollinated, so it is not what uh, causes uh, hay fever. Um, so here are four different examples. There's actually 25 different goldenrod species native to Michigan. Um, uh, so you have stiff goldenrod on the upper left, 
uh, which is about that tall and, and doesn't flop much, hence the name. Um, zigzag goldenrod, which is about, oh, 18 inches um, and uh, likes a little bit more shade, that's upper right. Um, uh, on lower left is fireworks goldenrod, one of my favorites. It's called that because when it blooms, it has these like arching, uh, you know, the fireworks that go up and when they explode, it's like fireworks that goes, it looks like that. And, uh, uh, and then Canada goldenrod, which may appear in your yard all by itself. And asters, there's many, many different kinds of asters. New England aster is the go-to aster, but there's also heart-leaved aster, which is more of a wood variety. There's uh, calico aster, there's all kinds of different asters. And asters and sunflowers are great combinations together, and they're also particularly good for the late season pollinators when insects are at their peak. Um, all kinds of sunflowers are good. This is one of our native sunflowers, oxeye sunflower. Um, but there's many, many uh, different kinds of them. And black-eyed Susan is actually a short-lived plant, but it reseeds re uh, re re uh, readily. Um, and there's various versions of them, and they, they create great, wonderful blocks of color. They aren't too tall, they're very easy to grow. And tick seed, or coreopsis, uh, is another one that's very good uh, on the, 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 the top five for keystone plants. Um, and is usually yellow, sometimes has, is red or has pops of red in it like this. And then I threw in a couple slides of the common, um, we, we don't have time in this talk for me to go through, and besides it would just make your eyes glaze over to go through different plants, but one of the ones you hear about a lot is Joe Pieweed. Um, uh, this is against my garage, and uh, it is an absolute butterfly magnet, um, as, and uh, hence the monarch on the right. And golden alexanders become one of my favorite plants. I planted it by those cedar trees and now in my front yard. It greens up early, stays green late in May. It's just emerging with these yellow flowers right now. It, it is very mannerly. It's only about like two feet tall with the flowers a little bit taller than that. Um, if you wanna keep it neat, you may trim the flower heads off after, uh, after it blooms. Um, I'll probably do that in the front, but not in the back. <laughs> And of course, um, asters, which I already talked about, and purple cone flowers. There's many different kinds of cone, native cone flower, um, uh, but those are very reliable plants, uh, easy to find, good, good native plants to have. And bee balm is another one that pollinators absolutely love. So to, uh, to conclude, your garden can make a big difference in the biodiversity and water quality crisis. Um, if you want to reduce storm runoff and improve water quality, you can plant more plants and different plants. You can have, avoid compacting your soil. You can avoid adding paving um, or even take some out. And you can have rain gardens that help to slow runoff. Um, if you want to sequester carbon, you can reduce your lawn and replace that with shrubs and perennials and trees, stuff that uh, will absorb a lot more carbon because there's just simply more leaves. Um, plant trees especially. Um, avoid disturbing the soil. It turns out that when you do regular tilling, um, you're actually releasing carbon from that soil into the air. So it's making the soil less fertile and not helping the air at all. Um, and of course, you can use an electric lawnmower instead of gas powered. Uh, lawnmowers are actually worse than cars because cars have catalytic converters. The lawnmower doesn't and it's sending all that exhaust right to you. Uh, the, and then if you want to increase pollination, um, you can have more flowers, you can plan for continuous bloom over the season, uh, you can uh, keep your plant material through the winter and do the cleanup in the spring when it's frankly easier to break off those stalks anyway. Uh, the, you can provide water sources and cover for insects and birds. And something we can all do is teach our children and our grandchildren the names of plants and, uh, and insects because you don't value what you don't recognize and you don't recognize what you can't name. And, and so especially when so many of our kids are growing up in urban and suburban environments, they, they have a very limited plant range. I mean, how many, how many of your kids or grandkids could name five different species of trees? and recognize them, you know, and uh, the, the, so having them be able to have a sense of nature and an experience of it is hugely important. But as human beings, we all need to change the way we view nature, that we need to stop thinking of nature as something that we can dominate and turn into whatever we want. 
Uh, we need to embrace biodiversity in our yards and in our communities and our public spaces as well as our, our own yards. And we need to share the earth with other living things. And with that, we can turn the lights back on and, uh, and I will take questions. And if you didn't pick it up, I have a handout that lists all kinds of useful references for people that are saving, saving you reading time because I've spent a lot of time doing it. So I, I, do, I do have a question. Um, so I really enjoy spring flowers, the tulips and daffodils, and planted them profusely through my yard as well as the two gardens that I maintain in the city. What would you recommend as an alternative? Um, well, first of all, there's nothing wrong with having early spring blooming bulbs. I have, I have aconite, which I noticed there were pollinators on in March. So one of the advantages of the non-native plants is sometimes they can bridge those seasons where there isn't continuous bloom in the native plants that we have. Um, and you don't have to rip up every plant that you have already had. Okay. You know, it's really more about and rather than or, but it is about as you move forward making intentional choices that you lean towards the native plants as opposed to the non-native plants. So, you know, there are some, some early spring blooming plants, but really not as many. I mean, bulbs don't, um, you know, they're, they're all from Asia, frankly, and uh, is where most of them come from. Um, but there's nothing that says that it's bad to have daffodils. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, because I'm all the time. <laughs> so, yeah, I do too, and I have, you know, I, I have a bunch of them. Good. So, yeah. You had so much information in there. Are you going to be posting that, like maybe on the Huntington Woods website or something? You can answer that. The, the, uh, the presentation will be available through the library. We recorded it today, so it will be available through the library. Well, how is that available? I'm sorry? How, how is, it available? is it available? Just on the site. <coughs> or how do I access it? Oh, I, I would check with the library. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Whatever, Whatever channel the library uses. Yeah. YouTube or whatever. <laughs> okay. So one thing I took out of this talk for reasons of time, and I did go a little longer than 40 minutes, so sorry. The, 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 I actually cut this down from a two hour presentation. So we <laughs> yeah. the, uh, uh, the, the one of the things uh, is, is cultivars versus natives. Mm -hmm. uh, and this goes to your question of, of you know, what, what should I plant? What you see in a lot of the garden centers, and they'll say, now, now they increasingly start to say native plant, like yeah. you know, an aster. So here's, here's, the, here's the, 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 the tricky part, is that, that the, what they sell in garden centers have been carefully designed by horticulturalists and bred to be to have certain characteristics: leaf color, how high they are, how profusely they bloom, you know, the shape of the blooms, all of that kind of stuff. As a rule of thumb, the more they've messed with the shape of the bloom, the less useful it is to the pollinators. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, 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 they may be able to use the nectar, but not the pollen or the nectar may not be as good, or may not just not produce as much of it. Because a lot of those cultivars are also, uh, they're not grown from seed because they want very consistent products, so they're all clones. So you're not adding to biodiversity because they are literally all the same plant, you know, when you see them at the, the garden center, you know, genetically. Um, however, they can be really helpful. So like in my garden, I've planted asters that grow taller and are more rangy kind of looking in the back beds. Um, and next to my patio and around the fountain and the places where you're going to see people, uh, where people will be seeing it a lot, I've planted a dome aster, which is looks sort of like a mom that's not cultivated. Uh, it, and it's, it's you know, only about like that, that tall. So, so I've kind of tried to sort of bridge it by saying the places that, that, that where, where I want more of a garden design kind of look, uh, and they have more cultivars, but not all cultivars. Uh, and even those cultivars are native, cultivars of native plants, um, uh, but, uh, but they're not. Uh, and so I'm gradually, as I'm learning more about native plants and gaining more experience with them, I'll you know, continue to migrate. So I'm in the process of redoing my front lawn um, and uh, taking out yet more grass. And uh, uh, the, the, so I've been moving it out in waves of every season. <laughs> And uh, uh, so I planted golden Alexander and coral bells, the native coral bells, which actually are doing just great as a row. 
And this year I'm going to be adding prairie drop seed, which is a native grass, um, to that. So when I'm going for my rule of design for uh, front yards is they have to look good at 25 miles an hour. And uh, you know, so, so front yards are not the place to put the specimen plant that's this tall. You don't want to see it. The, uh, put that next to your patio. So, so what I'm trying to do is do, do rows of plants so that you have that coherence and have a couple of species that are repeated a lot. Um, and so that's, that, that, so far that's been successful, but that's where I'm headed with that. But the backyard, you know, it's like the further back you get in my yard, the more wild it can become, and it doesn't have to be nice and neat. So I'm, I'm going to be very interested this summer and in coming years to see, you know, exactly what it does do. You know, I'm taking my best bet, I'm planting shrubs, I'm making a special trip up to Lansing to go to wild types, which is like an hour and a half away, <laughs> um, because they're the ones that have the best shrubs, if you want native shrubs. So, um, uh, so I'm going to get those to anchor along my back fence where I also have power lines, so I needed shrubs because they wouldn't grow so tall that mm -hmm. it's not like planting a tree in it. Okay. Do you remember anything in the fall yeah. in terms of cleanup? Or do you just, in terms of like, especially if I know they're a pretty good size or whatever, and they're, now they're done for the year, do you drop them off and compost them or just let them fall where they are? Uh, you know, I, I, unless it's like in the way of something, I just leave everything okay. in the fall. And the shoots come up through and, 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 the, and then what I did was this spring, I did spring cleanup where I cut off the stalks, but I left stalks about that tall on things because mm -hmm. the insects use the, the dead stalks to make nests in. And, uh, and and not just over winter, but in oh. the spring to put oh. nests in. So, so, so when I did do spring cleanup, I did it, but leaving a lot of the stalks, I just took off some of the rangy stuff. I also noticed that the stuff that I did leave, by the end of March, the wind had pretty much blown it all down anyway. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so another thing I do, and I've done this for years and years, is every fall, um, I go out and not only rake my own lawn, I get my neighbor's leaves, and I have one of those leaf whacker things, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is like a weed whacker in a barrel, and, uh, and it chops the leaves up to smaller pieces. And the advantage of that is that they decompose faster, but they also don't blow away. Um, and I use that as natural mulch, so I literally spend, you know, weekends chopping up leaves and then spreading <laughs> them around right. that garden bed so that it will build up the soil over time and then I won't have to mulch in the spring. So there, there is also a theory of um, weeding that when you're weeding, like let's say you want to get the dandelions out and so forth, you just you know cut it off instead of like pulling it out by the root and disturbing the soil, you literally cut it and then just drop the, 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 the plant material right where it is. Mm -hmm. So you can literally create green mulch so you don't have to haul it away and you Obviously, anything that's, that's that active seeds in it that you don't want, you would not do that with, and or anything like poison ivy, you wouldn't do that with. But uh, but other plants, you literally can just let them like decompose mm -hmm. under the other plants. Mm -hmm. So that's another way to avoid the work of cleanup, but also create more of a natural environment. Mm -hmm. So if you, I hate to read this question here, but so if you cut the top of a weed off, my mom would you know made me like dig them out. I mean, in her vegetable garden. So does that like kill the weed when you cut its top off and you can leave the root down there and then it, the dandelion won't come back? Uh, the key word is eventually. <laughs> the, 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 I mean, think about it, it's put all that energy into its spring growth. You know, if you cut it off, it's now lost all of that energy um, that it put into that. So it may come up with like smaller leaves or something like that if you cut that off. You know, so so ba basically, you can knock it back a lot. But what it means is you don't have to disturb the roots of everything around it by yanking it out. You know, and you know there are things like thistles that have a long tap root. Yeah. So if you weed those when they're they're young, you can pull out the you know loosen the soil a little bit, and you can pull out the whole tap root. Otherwise, it will spring back from the tap root. So you know, it's one of those things that the books I read have said you know cut don't don't. Uh, but I, I think there is a place for pulling weeds. Um, uh, you know, just it, just be aware that there are other options. Mm -hmm. I do exactly that with my dandelions. I, I just pull out, especially the little pod that makes the seeds, yeah. and the leaves, and it keeps them in control, you know, so they're not all over the place, and I don't have to use anything on them, so that works well. The other question um, is, um, when is it safe to remove leaves to make your mulch so you're not disturbing any possible larvae or... I've wondered about that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I figure 
that the, um, I mean, I mean another, another thing is, is, is leave the leaves for the winter. Yes. So, uh, so, so, but you know, I'm, I'm raking leaves off of lawns mm -hmm. where, you know, okay. there's not much that's gonna pupate there anyway. Right. So, uh, so, 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 you know, I take the leaves from the places where you have to remove them, chop them up and put them everywhere else. Okay. I don't bother to remove the leaves from the places that are the planting beds. Okay. I just let those leaves be there. We are surrounded by so many trees that there's just such a huge layer. That yeah, I mean, that's what builds up soil. Yeah. Is, uh, in fact, a, a friend of mine who's been into native plants in um, Roseville for, gosh, 20 years, mm -hmm. she, she and, and our, our area has, Roseville, St. Clair Shores, has very thick, heavy clay mm -hmm. um, uh, and, uh, and very little topsoil. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and she planted prairie plants in her backyard, and she did it for about like 18 years mm -hmm. before she moved to somewhere else. And she said that it literally built up soil. Mm -hmm. That you know, over those 18 years. Oh, another thing about the deep roots is that just like the top of plants die back, some portion of the roots die back too. So now you've got organic material that's already there in in, in the soil. So the combination of roots, root dieback, you know leaves and other plant material falling and decomposing on the top over an 18 year period literally created topsoil. Mm -hmm. That's why the prairies were such great soil. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.